Hi everyone, welcome back to another video where we use a photo from the news to level up your English. Today we are going to focus on lots of things. First, we're going to be adding lots of description using defining and non-defining relative clauses. Yes, I'm going to explain the difference and yes, you are going to get it. I promise. We're also going to look at lots of synonyms to help you speculate. These are words that are commonly confused and definitely a nice high C1 level. So if you're doing a language exam, this will be really useful for you. We're going to recycle some of the structures from previous videos. If you haven't watched them, I will leave a link below. You can check them out after this. And of course, as always, I'm going to be giving you an analysis of all the grammar that I use in the different examples. Grab a notebook, something to write with so you can join me. If you want to share your ideas, please put them in the comments below and I'm happy to give you some feedback. By the way, if you are new to my channel, hi, my name's Anisa and I've been teaching English to adults for over 20 years. This channel is all about me helping you improve your English without spending a fortune on classes. So let's go. So let's take a look at today's photo, which is once again from the new site Reuters. I like pointing out collocations in all my videos because it is a surefire way to sound more natural when you're speaking. So a surefire way, that's a perfect one to say something that is certain or really very likely to happen. Now, I often say, take a look. Let's take a look at a photo, but we could also say, have a look. Let's have a look. Or if you want to be more concise, you could just say, let's look at a photo. Now I have purposefully chosen this photo because there are not many elements in it. And that's because we're going to be focusing on the grammar, those different clauses and on synonyms to rephrase. So let's take a quick minute, pause this video and answer the question, what do you see? What do you see in this picture? Okay, so if you're like me, you've probably said something very similar. There are trees, flowers, specifically cherry blossoms. Then there are people, a couple of people, and there's a bridge. Great. Now, we're going to go quite quickly through the first steps of expanding these points into sentences, as I'm sure most of you have already written full sentences. So to expand these words into full sentences, we're just going to keep asking lots of questions. How many people are there? How old do they look? Where are they? All of these questions are really easy, but they're going to help us add more detail. And then we're going to add that detail using some nice grammar. How many people are there? Okay, there are two people. First of all, this is an irregular plural. Don't tell me there are peoples. Mm -mm. Some people do use the term persons, but this is much more formal and it has that connotation of the law, something legal. For example, um, five persons were arrested in connection with the burglary that took place last Tuesday. Or three persons are named in the noise complaint filed by a neighbor. So people is the preferred option here. But we can be more specific because these are definitely not children. They are two adults. Now, students often ask me how to pronounce this word. Is it adults or is it adults? Honestly, it depends on where you're from. So in England, we say a ah, adults. The stress is on the first part, a ah, adults. But in North America, you would say adults adults. So in England, 
I see two adults. In North America, I see two adults. I see two adults. I see two adults. It's up to you, so choose the one that feels more comfortable for you. There are two people who look middle-aged. Ooh, this is longer, so it is less concise, but it does have a nice relative clause. Who look, we're describing those people. And it's got a compound adjective. A compound adjective is just when you have two different modifiers and you're linking them together. Middle-aged. You cannot separate them and say a middle person. No, it's a middle-aged person. Now, this is quite a small picture, so if you think they are young adults as opposed to middle-aged adults, that's fine. It's just an example. And where are they? Well, they're on a bridge. We're going to add more detail about this bridge later, but hopefully you have used the preposition on, not in a bridge, not at a bridge, they're not under the bridge, they are on a bridge. You could definitely say they are standing on a bridge if you wanted to describe their action in more detail. Okay, so it is time for your first challenge. I would like you to take these ideas and put them into one sentence. We've got two people, not just one person, two people. We're saying that they're adults or adults. We want to give the idea that they are middle-aged and we want to say that they're on a bridge. So your challenge, how many of those ideas can you take and put in one sentence? Pause this video and see if you can do it. So your sentences might be slightly different to mine, but more or less, you should have something like, there are two adults who are middle-aged standing on a bridge. Or there are two middle-aged adults on a bridge. Or two middle-aged adults are standing on a bridge. Something like that. Okay, let's get a little bit more interesting and we're going to add some description. Specifically, we're going to describe this bridge. In order to do that, I'm going to use some non-defining relative clauses. Don't panic because I'm going to make this really easy to understand. And honestly, the difference is mainly noticeable if you're writing. So anybody who is doing an IELTS or Cambridge exam or university writing, this is really important. So let's take a look at these two sentences. My sister, who I love, came to visit me yesterday. My sister, who I love, came to visit me yesterday. Hmm. Now, the only difference here is the punctuation, those commas that I've used, which, of course, add little pauses. But do they really make a difference in the meaning? What do you think? Hmm. Yes, yes, they do. They make a big difference. So they are both grammatically correct, but there is a difference in the meaning. We add commas when we are saying that this information is extra. So we can remove the information without affecting the meaning of the sentence. Let's see what happens when we remove that information. My sister came to visit me yesterday. How many sisters do I have in this example? My sister came to visit me yesterday. One, I have one sister and that one sister came to visit me. Okay, now in the second one, there are no commas. So that information is essential for you to understand the meaning. Who visited me? My sister who I love. Okay, how many sisters do I have? It's not clear. 
it could be two, it could be five, but you do know that I only love one of them, and it's that sister who came to visit me. So, we put commas around that extra information that is not necessary. That is a non-defining relative clause. I don't need that information to define the meaning. And we don't put commas around information that is essential for the reader to really understand your meaning. That is a defining relative clause. So, commas, meh, you can take the information out. It's not important. No commas, all the information is important. We need it to understand the main idea. Don't worry if you're still a little bit confused. We're going to go back to our picture here and look at the bridge. Now, if we had lots of bridges, then we would need to add essential information to really help the person identify the bridge that we are talking about. For example, the bridge that is for pedestrians only, or the bridge that was under construction for ages last summer, or the bridge that always gets busy around four o'clock in the afternoon, or the bridge that leads to that really cute little cafe where we had dinner after seeing Mamma Mia last winter. Okay, but those are all defining clauses because you need that information to understand what bridge I'm talking about. Here, in this picture, there is only one bridge, so I don't need to define it. I can just add some nice little extra detail. It's not necessary information. It's just nice to know. So, in order to use these non-defining relative clauses today, we're going to do two things. First, we're going to use commas, because the comma means meh, it's not that important. And secondly, we're going to use which instead of that. Now, I know when people are speaking, they're really lazy and they use that, that, that for practically everything. But today we're going to be good. We're going to follow the rules and we're going to do this properly. So let's focus on two pieces of information about the bridge. We could use the color. So it's a green bridge or a bright green bridge and the material a metal bridge. At least, I think it's metal. It appears to be metal. I could be wrong. So, pause this video and try and write a couple of sentences about the bridge. Try using these non-defining clauses to add the information. And then I'm going to share my examples and we'll analyze the grammar together. Hopefully you paused the video and you have some examples. I know not all of you did, but let's take a look at mine. So there's always somebody who doesn't listen to the instructions. This first example is for you. This example does not include any additional clauses. They are on a green metal bridge. Now we have to remember our order of adjectives here. So color before material. You cannot say a metal green bridge. Oh, that would be wrong. So let's take a look at this sentence. They are on a metal bridge which is green. Now in this sentence we are prioritizing the description of the material, metal, and then we're adding the color as that additional information. It's extra information, so we've got a comma. They are on a metal bridge, which is green. What about they are on a metal bridge which has been painted green? Oh, now this sentence says exactly the same thing, so why am I more impressed by it? Well, if you guess passive voice, then you would be right. So here we're saying that the bridge has been painted by someone. 
it's not important who did the action of painting it. But you know, now that I think about it, it's not exactly the same in meaning because you could give somebody the impression that the bridge has not always been green. Maybe it used to be a different color and it has since been painted green. So that is one way of interpreting this sentence. My next example, they are on a green bridge, which appears to be made of metal. So conversely, we could focus on the color green, put that in the main clause, and then add the material as extra information. This is up to you what you want to prioritize and focus on. Now, obviously, I'm not actually there, and it's quite hard to be 100% sure what material was used to construct the bridge just by looking at this photo. So it's a good idea to add appears to be. They're on a green bridge, which appears to be made of metal. Oh. So let's add in a verb here. What are they doing on the bridge? Well, let's keep it easy. They are standing, right? They are standing on a bridge. So as you're describing what you see in the photo, let's use that verb. I can see. I can see that they're standing on a bridge. I can see that they're standing on a green bridge, which appears to be made of metal. Now, if you're wondering why I've got that in brackets, it's because it is optional. So some people do say it all the time, other people drop it. It's up to you. And it's optional because the following clause begins with a subject. If you have a subject starting that next clause, then we don't really need the that. I can see they are standing on a green bridge, which appears to be made of metal. It's perfectly correct either way. Now, if you watched my previous videos on leveling up with photos, then you'll know that I shared some synonymous phrases. It appears as if, it looks as if, it seems as if. Keep these in mind because now we're going to have a look at other ways of speculating. So what is the man doing? What is he doing? He's taking a photograph. Okay, but can you be 100% sure that's what he's doing? Consider if there are any other alternatives. He could be on a video call to a friend, or you might use the verb and say he might be video calling a friend. There's a slim chance he's talking to his boss. Or I doubt he's checking his email, but it's a remote possibility. Oh, look at those lovely collocations that we've got now. A slim chance, a remote possibility. So as we cannot be 100% sure, I should have asked the question, what does the man appear to be doing? And then in your answer, you might have said something like, it appears as if he's taking a photo. It looks as if he's taking a photo. It seems as if he's taking a photo. Okay, but today's class is really featuring lots of synonyms. So can you think of a synonym for if in these sentences? Hmm. And the answer is though, though. So, this is exactly the same meaning as if, as though. It appears as though. It looks as though. It seems as though. It's up to you which one you want to use, but when you hear it, remember the meaning is the same. But I'm sure most of you usually say, I think. What do you think the man is doing? I think he's taking a photo. It's not wrong, but it does get a little bit boring. I think, I think, I think, especially if you're going to do a language exam or try to impress somebody. So we're going to have a look at some synonyms with the same meaning of I think. How many can you think of right now? Hmm. 
hopefully you have come up with a few alternatives and you might have verbs like I believe he's taking a photo or I guess he's taking a photo. Great. But today we are going to have a look at six less familiar or maybe slightly trickier ones. I reckon, I reckon he's taking a photo. I suppose, I suppose he's taking a photo. I suspect, I suspect he's taking a photo. I surmise, I surmise he's taking a photo. I assume, I assume he's taking a photo. I presume, I presume he's taking a photo. Now, first of all, I would like to point out that all of these are really, really similar. So the ones you choose to use are probably going to be based on your own personal style of speaking and maybe a little bit to do with the context. So let's get started with I reckon. I reckon. This is a synonym for think and although it is more commonly used in the UK, it is still fine to use it in North American varieties of English too. So, oh, I reckon it's gonna rain. I use this a lot because it's always about to rain. <laughs> I suppose, I suppose. Make sure you stress that second syllable. Suppose. I suppose he's taking a photo. So it's just something that we think is likely to be true. It's the same as saying I think. It's just giving you options. Suspect. Suspect. I suspect he's taking a photo. This is one of those words that is written the same way as the verb and the noun, but it is pronounced differently because the stress falls on different syllables. Actually, this is the video topic that I'm going to do next. So if you have not subscribed to my channel, please do that now. You do not want to miss that pronunciation session. So notice the difference here. The police, suspect the prime suspect had an accomplice. The police suspect, suspect, this is the verb, so we're going to stress that second syllable. The prime suspect, suspect, it's a noun, so we're going to stress the first syllable. So I suspect the man who's standing on the bridge is taking a photo. Now, the next one is quite formal, so you're probably not going to hear it a lot. Surmise, surmise. Now, note the stress is on the second syllable again, and there is not a strong R. Even in American pronunciation, you're not going to say surmise. That sounds like Mr. Mize and his wife. Sir Mize and Lady Mize. No, don't do it. So don't add that R sound. It's surmise. Surmise. That lovely schwa sound. S, S, surmise. Now, I surmise the woman who is standing very close to the man is his partner. So what we're doing here is I don't have much evidence. It's a hypothesis, it's a theory. So I'm taking a guess. It's an educated guess, but it's still a guess. Note that I have said partner because I'm just covering my bases. I don't know if she is his girlfriend or his fiance or his wife. I'm not sure, but I surmise that they are in some kind of romantic relationship. Another word that you can use when you don't have any proof is assume. Assume. I assume he's taking a photo, but I don't know. I assume the woman is his partner, but I don't know. So you are accepting that this is true, that this is real, that this is a fact, but without any proof. Now, so many people mix up 
assume and presume. Assume, presume. So many people mix this up. I want you to think about it this way. If you presume something, there is a high probability that it's true. Presume, probability. But if you assume something, you don't have anything to base it on. It's just a guess. So presume, probability. Assume, you don't have anything to base it on. So I presume that he is taking a photo because he's standing there holding his phone in front of him. So logically, I would say there's a high probability that's what he's doing. I could be wrong. So you can definitely use think, of course, the verb is correct, but to expand your range of vocabulary, why not try one of these synonyms? So to practice, use one of the verbs that we've just discussed to answer the following question. Where do you think this photo was taken? Hmm. And is it a total guess or do you have some reason for thinking this? Pause this video, write down your sentence. If you want my feedback, then just leave it in the comments below. Okay, so for me, I take a look at this photo and I see lots of cherry blossom. I immediately associate cherry blossom with Japan. I know, I know they're also in lots of other countries. I recently found out that they might have originated on Jeju Island in South Korea. But for today, we're going to say probably Japan. So for that reason, I think that there's a high probability that this photo was taken in Japan, which means I am going to use that verb presume. I presume this photo was taken in Japan because Japan is famous for its cherry blossom trees. So there's a high probability that I'm right. What was your example sentence? Were you sure or were you taking a total guess? Do you remember our first question? What do you see? Well, we started off with a basic answer. Two people on a bridge and some trees. Then we added some verbs. I can see. They are standing. And some compound adjectives. Middle-aged adults. We also used phrases to speculate. Appears to be. And I love some passive voice. To be made of metal. And of course, today's focus was on non-defining relative clauses. So, a green bridge which appears to be made of metal. Wow. So, now we have, well, I can see two middle-aged adults standing on a green bridge which appears to be made of metal. Okay, that is a really nice answer, but let's expand it because we also focused on synonyms of verbs to express speculation. So, I presume. To presume is when there is a high probability that you are right. I presume this photo was taken in Japan. Oh, some more passive voice. This photo was taken in Japan. And now, Let's add our reasoning. Why do I presume this? Well, I presume this photo was taken in Japan as the country is famous for its spectacular cherry blossoms. I could have used because, but because is a little bit boring. So as is a good synonym. And why not add another non-defining relative clause? I presume this photo was taken in Japan, as the country is famous for its spectacular cherry blossoms, which 
are prominently featured in this shot. And that's another example of passive voice. They are prominently featured in this shot by the photographer. Oh, beautiful. So our answer is looking really nice, but we did have a look at lots more examples of phrases and collocations that we can use to speculate. So why not add those in to our answer now? It seems as though there's a remote possibility. I also get the feeling. And for the last one, I actually changed the word form. Instead of saying, I assume, I've changed it to a noun. It's just an assumption. So we also can put in some non-defining relative clauses to describe people. Now, in this case, I'm not going to use the uh, pronoun which, I've used who. I also get the feeling that the woman who is standing next to him, of course, I'm going to contract that and say, I also get the feeling that the woman who's standing next to him is his partner. Remember, there are only two people in this photo, so I can use this as extra information. Let's see how much you have leveled up your English. We started off with our answer of two people on a bridge and some trees. And now our final answer. Well, I can see two middle-aged adults standing on a green bridge which appears to be made of metal. I presume this photo was taken in Japan as the country is famous for its spectacular cherry blossoms, which are prominently featured in this shot. It seems as though the man is taking a photo of the scenery, but there's a remote possibility that he's on a video call to his boss. I also get the feeling that the woman who's standing next to him is his partner. But to be honest, it's just an assumption. Okay, so another video that was quite long. And the main takeaways from today are the grammar. That difference between a defining clause where you need that information to understand what's going on and a non-defining relative clause where you're just adding extra description that's nice to have. Remember, it's the difference between me having one sister and lots of sisters, but I only actually like one of them. We also looked at expanding your range of vocabulary with these lovely synonyms. Some of them are very high level. So assume, presume. I assume something, but I don't have anything to base it on presume, yeah, there's a high probability that I'm right. And we also looked at a little bit of pronunciation because you cannot learn new vocabulary without pronunciation. So that different stress, what syllable am I stressing? Is it to suspect somebody of doing something? Or look, I have found the suspect. That is quite important. And I also threw in some collocations because I love collocations. That's what makes you sound really natural. So a surefire way of sounding natural is to use collocations. As always, if you have found this video useful, please like it and subscribe so you don't miss any in the future. If you have any questions about anything or you just want some feedback, leave me a comment below. And don't be greedy, share with your friends. Now, thanks everyone, happy studying, and I will see you in the next video. Bye guys.